So what am I going to do today is basically to um, talk about machinima. I'm going to give you a brief definition and genealogy, basically, uh, but I promise I'm going to be very, very quick. And I'm also I also want to discuss briefly some emerging trends that I think you might find interesting. Um, I do at least, so uh, maybe you'll find them as well, or maybe not, you, you'll tell me at the end. And finally, my uh, thesis, um, my main argument is that machinima is a, is a new avant-garde. Um, and why, I, why do I think that it's relevant and it's, um, it's uh, potentially interesting? So as Pedro said, for uh, several years now, I've been investigating the medium of machinima, uh, which I will discuss, uh, discuss shortly. Um, suffice to say is that I consider machinima a genre of video art. And uh, my research also comprises a curatorial practice, which involves the organizing and staging of exhibitions and events of, about, around machinima. Uh, examples include the Milan Machinima Festival. Um, we had uh, five editions so far, and the six is later for 2023 and Viral, which is an online, uh, online platform that offers screenings of machinima created by artists and filmmakers uh, uh, whose work uh, lies at the intersection of video art, cinema, animation, gaming, and many other things. Um, collectively, we curated uh, 43 exhibitions since April 2020, comprising two seasons. Um, we have a curatorial staff. Um, it's, it's, been, it's been going um, really well. Um, so, I want to start, um, and also at the end of the conversation, I will share some links in uh, in the chat for you if you're interested. Um, so I encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter, and we'll share a bunch of events. So, um, what is machinima? Uh, the interesting thing about machinima is that notoriously uh, hard to define. Okay. Um, so I, I need some help here, and I'm going to use uh, the aid of uh, John Anson, who is a Swedish artist, also a machinima maker. And um, we recently had a conversation, and um, I asked him, what is machinima to you? You're so prolific, you're so active on the scene, so what is machinima to you? And he basically gave me this, this explanation that I'm sharing with you. Uh, simply put, uh, machinima is the use of video game technology as source material to produce animated films. Artists use video game technology in different ways to make cinematic animations, but the most common and the most pure quote unquote approach to making machinima was originally through live performance acts and recorded acts within video games. Back then, the charm was how to work around the limitations of the existing technology to make new narratives. Nowadays, you can create animated films using game engines like Unity, Unreal Engine, etc., etc. Um, so there's a lot of information here and I wanted to unpack it. And basically I'm just gonna highlight a couple of things that uh, I think are important to fully grasp the meaning and the relevance of machinima. Um, we're talking about something that is a process and a product, okay? Specifically, it consists of um, creating, so it's a practice of creating animated film using video game technology. And video game technology is a very broad term and includes everything from the video game themselves and the tools used to create the video games. Uh, it was talking about Unity 3D, Unreal Engine, et cetera, et cetera. And it's also the outcome of, of this practice. So Machinima, again, is, again, keep this in mind, is a process and a, and a product. Um, and the other two key terms that I find interesting that the definition are constraint and workaround. In other words, is basically working against the machine, um, trying to bypass and overcome the limitations that the creator faces when working with an existing text. And so the machine is also a workaround, a solution. Um, so in a sense, machinima is a solution to a non-existing, in the sense, made up, if you will, problem. Because machinima is really about using a video game for purposes different than playing a video games. Or perhaps, like others have suggested, machinima is an alternative way of playing a video game. Specifically, it is a way of, specifically, it is a, way of playing, uh, a video game with the goal of creating, as he said, new narratives, new narratives, new stories, stories that are different from the machinima itself. And so machinima always implies a transformation, right? It's uh, you start with a video game and you end up with what I call a game video. Uh, which is um, basically a video game made, um, a video made with a video game, right? You remove the interactive element, the ergodic element, as uh, somebody would say, and you are ba you basically have an 
audiovisual text, right? Kind of like a contradiction in terms, right? It's like, why would I use a video game to make a video, like to break it, to use it not at its full potential? Well, um, there are a lot of reasons why you would do that because um, it's also a form of meta play. It's another way of engaging with the video game. It's very challenging, it's very interesting, it's very uh, difficult also to achieve. Now, what I'm talking about is re really not new. In fact, machine has been around for a long time, uh, almost a quarter of a century, as a matter of fact. And uh, according to many, or to some, um, machinima is um, kind of like uh, not dead, but definitely something that has been, right? Something that is, is gone. Because if you look at, for example, um, Google Trends, right? Uh, and you ask for, and you, and you look for the popularity of machinima. Yeah, so I was, as I was saying, why would you make it, why, why would you make a video using a video game? Well, as a matter of fact, it's highly contradictory, but also challenging. It's a form of meta play. It's a form of engaging with the text that, that uh, is highly rewarding if you can actually um, uh, get through like the difficulties and the challenges that you always face. Now, as I was saying before, um, machinery is not new. In fact, um, many of you might have might already seen machinima, might already be familiar with this medium. It's been around for a quarter of a century, actually. And many people argue that machinima is kind of like dead or has been is something that used to be popular. In fact, if you, if you look at um, Google Earth, uh, sorry, Google Trends, you will see that uh, um, in a sense, we are like past uh, peak machinima in a sense that uh, machinima as a term worldwide in the United States where it was born um, was uh, achieved its maximum visibility around uh, 2009, 2011, and then kind of like went down and almost disappeared from uh, the search engine, right? And the same thing for the United States, same decline, same curve, same, uh, same problem. The problem is that when you talk about Google um, uh, Trends, uh, you're basically missing out a big piece of, uh, of uh, what's really happening, you know, beyond, beyond the screen, beyond the, um, the uh, uh, sort of the search uh, queries, basically. Um, my theory is that uh, what we really witness is not a crisis of machinima as a practice, machinima as a, mm, a process. We are actually um, facing a crisis of machinima as uh, as a term, as the very term machinima uh, sort of kind of like disappear, is not used anymore. Um, just a background information, um, machinima as a term uh, was coined approximately 20 years ago uh, by two uh, practitioners, uh, Paul Marino and Yuk Ankung. Uh, unfortunately, Yuk Ankok died a few years ago. Oh, he had a heart attack. He was very young. Um, Paul Marino is still alive and kicking. And uh, machinima is basically a portmanteau of two different terms, machine cinema and machine animation. It's the idea of using, once again, um, video game engines, especially to create some kind of a narrative, right? Um, if we look at the origins as the source of machinima, um, there are many stories, there are many genealogies, there are many like um, backstories. And I just wanted to emphasize in this case too, um, because they're both relevant to understand why machinima kind of like disappeared from the radar. But as I argue, something else replaced it and became extremely powerful and extremely interesting uh, visually. So there's one story that basically um, traces back the uh, origins of machinima to um, the vernacular. Uh, the experiments of uh, people like the United Rangers film, uh, Diary of a Camper, which was a film made inside of a video game, uh, Quake, uh, Quake 3 specifically. And um, it was a game demo file. It was a, it was a video that you couldn't watch because back then we didn't even have like the MP4 format or something. It was a video that you can, like a kind of like a demo, like a, an ex ex executable file that you could only watch through uh, quake, right? So I had a very limited viewership, but nonetheless, um, people using Quake were able to hack into the system, change the cameras, and basically create something new, something else, a narrative. Um, however, my favorite uh, genealogy, my favorite uh, mythopoiesis of machinima had, has got nothing to do with first-person shooters and uh, Quake in particular, but with Miltus Maneda's work, 
uh, miracle, which is basically just a recording of a plane that is flying in the sky. And then, in, you know, it, the, 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 the player basically reaches the ocean. And instead of a, the, the, the plane basically going underwater, it just bounces off, right? And is basically like performing a miracle, like Jesus is walking on, on the ocean, on the water. And um, so what's the main difference between these two? Well, basically on one side, you have a, uh, an audio visual, visual um, content file that is created within the gaming community. And on the other side, you have this kind of like installation created by uh, Miltus Manetas that is talking to a different kind of audience. And it's talking to the art world, right? And um, on one side is very kind of like geeky, the United Rangers films. On the other side, you have a different kind of geekness. You are talking to somebody who's um, familiar with contemporary art genres, convention, et cetera. And so whereas uh, the United Rangers films, which is like one hour, one, one minute and 20 seconds more or less, is a meta commentary on gaming culture. The other one is a meta commentary on visual culture as a whole. And uh, so on one hand, you have a comedy basically that is using popular culture and uh, popular cinema and TV as a reference. On the other side, you have basically video art. It's part of you know, found footage discovered by uh, Manetas uh, playing this game F18 Hornet. And whereas Diary of a Camper is only accessible through the internet, only from, from you know, to people who are playing the game um, and have installed the game on their computer, um, this um, video, Miracle, was exhibited in New York City at a very interesting um, uh, exhibition called Joint Ventures, curated by Nicola Burio, who is one of the most famous um, curators in the world, in a very prestigious gallery, the Gabriele Basilico Gallery, once again, in the center of the art world as, you know, in the United States of America. And so I used um, uh, our backers, uh, a magnificent 1982 book, The Our World, to um, basically try to make sense of these two competing narratives about the uh, origins of machinima. And the idea is that um, um, they're both uh, the gaming community and the our world community, two kinds of subcultures, some kind of communities. Uh, they both uh, use and appropriate video games to create artworks in this case, machinima, but they call them differently, right? So um, Manitas doesn't even use the word machinima. Nobody in the art world really uses the word machinima. They use digital video, they use art work, they talk about appropriation, they use a different language. And so for a while, machinima develops and grows and evolves within the uh, gaming community where it's actually incentivized and promoted by the industry itself. Some of the most popular uh, games have embedded um, uh, video editors like the Rockstar editor introduced by Rockstar Games in 2013, um, which prompts an explosion of machinima production with Grand Theft Auto V. Uh, the Sims, which was introduced in 2000, um, also has a very um, uh, developed and sophisticated uh, video editor to create machinima, to create these kind of videos. And even like the biggest producer of uh, GPUs in the world uh, recently, as early as 2020, introduced a way, a very sophisticated new uh, way of making machinima through their products, which is both software and obviously takes advantage of their powerful GPUs. However, we are talking about two different um, contexts, two different artifacts, two different communities. We're talking about the, commu the vernacular on one side when we talk about machinima where there's a high degree of redundancy. A lot of videos that are very similar, that are sort of like talking about games. They reference popular culture. They are distributed through channels like YouTube. And they kind of like plateau in the um, a decade ago and slowly but surely kind of disappear from the radar. And then you have a more kind of like avant-garde, experimental, artistic, um, forms of machinima, which is um, uh, marked by scarcity. Uh, there are very few examples of this kind of work within the video art community. It's definitely part of contemporary art. Um, it's not distributed online mostly, but through you know, Y Cube exhibitions, festival, etc. And you also have a different alternative trajectory, uh, a trajectory that it's really hard to trace through Google Trends or other you know, um, algorithmic um, uh, tools because it uses a different language. Um, the language of contemporary art is very niche, is very um, exclusive, if you will, um, elitist even. 
and is best articulated by Nicolas Bourreau himself, who wrote this fa very famous and I would say seminal book in 2002, 20 years ago, post-production, but he basically argues that um, art is, you know, the idea of originality in art is, is, is overrated, is obsolete, is archaic. All you have now is a continuous repurposing of existing material and the genius of the art is really uh, into appropriating and recontextualizing things like, you know, including video games, basically, um, into new spaces, new contexts, and assigning them new meanings, right? And so I always found these ideas very interesting, and this is why I pursue this kind of like trajectory. I, look, I was, I've been looking at the avant-garde machine for, for many, many years because I find it very interesting. And I do agree that on the other side, the vernacular machine has kind of like exhausted its potential and its, its format. Um, this is a, recur a very popular meme on Reddit about uh, the fact that all Sims machinima are pretty much the same. Um, but when I look at this and when I look at the kind of uh, avant-garde machinima using the Sims, I see two completely different um, environments, two completely different things. Uh, to me, uh, people using the Sims today to avant-garde machinima are like groundbreaking, are staggering, are really impressive. Uh, whereas the stuff that is kind of like shared on YouTube, on um, you know the the subreddit on Machinima, on 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 um, um, Reddit, for example, is not that 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 powerful. And I don't want to diminish or insult anybody, but it's just you know it's just redundant. It's it's you know there's so many of it that it's really hard to innovate and change. And so when I talk about Machinima, to me, I see so many different things. I see uh, something that is located at the intersection of video game, cinema. Uh, video art, um, even television, uh, because of you know distributed um, episodic content, uh, that is something that is uh, situated between theater, uh, puppetry, it's animation, but it's not traditional animation. Um, definitely appropriates the language of of um, contemporary art, uh, remix, remake, replay, reenactment. Uh, there's a lot of found footage uh, that is explicitly used by uh, several artists to create their, their production. And it's increasingly post-human. It's increasingly algorithmic. It doesn't require um, agency, human agency to uh, be created, be consumed. Um, and it's also a form of assemblage, a form of uh, the tournament, subversion, collage. It's a form of uh, intermedia. It's many different things. And this is why I find it very interesting, also because it's a hybrid. Again, it's not a game, but it looks like a game. It's not a film, but it looks like a film. Um, it's not animation, but it could be considered animated. So it's like this weird thing, right? It's hard to pin down, right? And so I wanted to share with you, because so far I, I, I spoke kind of like in, in abstract terms. Um, I wanted to show some examples of this, obviously, uh, considering like my uh, the the tragic like technological like challenges that I'm facing right now, I'm not I'm going to show you Machinima, but I just want to like you know inspire you to go and look and search for some of the stuff that I'm going to show you if you're not really familiar. And so I wanted to show you some trends that I find really interesting because they make Machinima even weirder, right? Keep Machinima weird, and these guys are definitely uh, making it weirder. So one trend that I that is emerging and that I find really interesting that I wanted to share with you today is the the remediation or recontextualization of theater through video games, right? This is something that has been with us for a very long time. The first examples can be traced back to 2010, 2000, even before. Um, this is not, uh, this is different from the notion of playable theater, which is a different thing, which I'm not gonna talk because it's just it would take us uh, too far. But um, by, by um, Remediation of theater, I mean the idea of using video game technology to perform in front of a, li a live audience and to um, basically um, kind of use the notion of the avatar, the performance, the simulation in, in a very interesting way. In a way, in a sense, all video games are theater because you're performing through an avatar, right? You're projecting your identity onto something else, onto, onto a screen, onto a stage, right? But these guys are pushing the envelope much further. So Amir Yadzi, for example, he's an Israeli artist and uh, he uses, for example, motion capture to have um, uh, a performance that is happening simultaneously on the screen and on the stage in front of a live audience, uh, and then it records the performance, which we shown in our in our uh, on our platform. Uh, so in this case, for example, you have a kind of like kind of like um, an audition for a character that's playing multiple roles um, for a Final Fantasy game, for example. 
Um, and so she's playing uh, different characters. She's um, in front of the camera. She is uh, changes identity three or four times during the talk. So it's very cutting edge. It's very different. Is this a game? Is this theater? Is this a film? Um, it, it's hard to pin down, right? Um, Cara Gott, an American artist, does the same. She uses Red Red Redemption 2 to perform plays in front of a live audience in New York, having the actors performing as characters on the screen. And once again, you have these, you know, multiple layers of performativity that is happening at the same time. Um, and there's also the, you know, the, the idea that things could go wrong because it's live, because it's not recorded, because you have a script, but also you're improvising in front of a live, audi a live audience. And it's very, very interesting. And it's, 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 it's something that is emerging more and more. Or you have guys like um, Sam Crane, uh, otherwise known as Rustic Mascara, who goes inside Grand Theft Auto V, and instead of shooting at people and trying to grab all the money and become rich, he performs Hamlet, he performs Shakespeare, and he gets killed over and over again, but it's like using the game in a very alternative way to um, do something else, right? Um, and he's right, by now, um, by the way, right now he's recruiting to, um, uh, for auditions, for, for finding people who wants to perform Shakespeare within Grand Theft Auto V, right? This is kind of bizarre. And then you have people like Pietro Babino, who's an Italian um, artist who actually, uh, how can I say, appropriates uh, uh, Grand Theft Auto V and it puts it right on the stage. So he uses the background, he uses a prop, he uses a narrative tool. So you have live actors performing within a space that is real concrete, but is also virtual. And um, Grand Theft Auto V here is not used as decoration, but it's actually part of the story, the character. So it's another way of reinventing theater using video games, right? Um, and then there are people, there are a lot of like, especially students that come from art schools, design schools, media study schools. They're using machinima now to create uh, the equivalent of the video essay, right? A, a genre studied by Catherine Grant, um, um, Kevin Billy, and many others. And so you have people, for example, studying um, the um, algorithm tracing and predicting algorithms using Grand Theft Auto V to tell the story, to tell, um, to talk about surveillance, and using a tool that is, by definition, um, a digital byproduct of this surveillance um, capitalism that. Shoshana Zubov discusses to tell this story and using and combining real uh, um, uh, sources like interviews that he does with activists, with scholars, and he tells the story through Grand Theft Auto rather than using you know, traditional means, right? Um, similarly, uh, um, Shorts Writers uh, is from the Netherlands, recently graduated in design, uses um, Grand Theft Auto V to um, discuss examine the behavior of NPCs, therefore algorithms within virtual worlds, right? Comparing and contrasting their uh, repurposing throughout the game, different scenes, different uh, scenarios, etc. And once again, you use the game to talk about the game. This is very meta and this is very interesting. This is not a promotional video about Grand Theft Auto V. This is actually a video made with a video game to talk about how video games portray reality, right? Um, again, many, many examples. Um, Felix Clay, uh, who is an Austrian, um, made this interesting work. Uh, and notice also the, 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 the use of the split screen in many of these videos to sort of like juxtapose, in this case, archival footage, found footage about uh, workers in um, Mexican workers uh, um, working in America and Grand Theft Auto V. So the game gets repurposed modded, transformed, altered, the, narrative, the original narrative is completely discarded to tell a story, in this case, about immigration, about um, uh, challenges, about labor. Um, so once again, there's, there's, a, there, there's, a, there's a level of engagement with the video game that is, uh, to me, it's our core. Our core in the sense that there's a lot of effort, there's a lot of time, there's a lot of skills that you need to perform and produce this kind of work, right? And then you have more traditional forms of um, uh, documentary where uh, the emphasis is on ethnography. So there are a lot of machinima in which the filmmakers interview uh, people playing um, specific games, um, gaming communities, gaming subcultures. So for example, these Icelandic um, 
uh, filmmaker, uh, John Bjarke Magnusson, uh, made this incredible documentary called the Even Asteroids Are Not Alone, which is um, dedicated to examine the community that plays this um, very popular um, uh, video game. And it's really about understanding how uh, bonds are created with, with video games, how relationships with people that are dispersed, geographically dispersed, they're all over the world, and yet they create very solid, very concrete, very powerful relationships through a video game that is usually criticized for its violence, for its you know, hyper-capitalistic logic, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you also have examples like you know, desktop um, documentary where you record the screen, right? And David Blandy was, a, was, was an artist working with Machinima and uh, digital media, uses um, Grand Theft Auto V once again to fly away during the pandemic and turns himself into a bird. And again, turns a hyper-violent video game into a uh, kind of like an escapade during the pandemic, during the lockdown. Uh, and it records the entire uh, production and then shares online. Okay. Um, Pedro, how much time do I have? Yeah, uh, we're still on time. We, we started a little bit late. So uh, I think uh, you still have about, I don't know, 10 minutes perfect. or so. Perfect, 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 perfect. Thank you. So um, playing the art world, um, there's another uh, trend that I wanted to share with you about the fact that some of the most prolific and visible uh, blue chip artists um, made machinima and use machinima as their main aesthetics. Um, you know, if we start the genealogy from Multus Manetas, the Greek artist that I mentioned uh, right at the beginning, there's an entire kind of like genealogy of uh, male artists that um, use machinima to basically express themselves from, you know, Brody Condon, Corder Kanjo, you know, that in 2002, the a New Yorker called, uh, you know, the Andy Warhol of the 21st century, uh, down to, you know, John Rothman. And I'm sure you're all familiar with this artist. But what I wanted to say is that uh, unlike video games that are, you know, very, you know, um, male gendered and, and there's, a, there's a strong, you know, um, gender imbalance in gaming, uh, when it comes to machinima, aside from these very visible uh, artists, what strikes me is that machinima is... Um, uh, is a medium, is a format, is a genre that is extremely popular with um, female and L LGBT um, artists. Um, I could make a lot of examples of what I'm just going to mention on Passani Capo. Um, you're probably familiar with Jackie Connolly, who's an American artist who made a series of incredible machinima using The Sims. And once again, when, when we were talking about the fact that, um, you know, uh, the input uh, journalists wrote about um, the same, uh, having reached a plateau, uh, this video is being boring, all the same. But you watch any video developed by, made by Jackie Connolly with the scenes, and we're talking about films that last, for example, 45 minutes. And it, it's it's like watching um, David Lynch, uh, a David Lynch nightmare uh, with some crazy situations. Um, they're very poetic, very abstract, very evocative. And this is... is um, uh, her latest work, and for the fir very first time, she used Grand Theft Auto V. And, and once again, it's an incredible work that um, has nothing to do with the original game. The game is used as raw material, as a source that is completely transformed. And it's it's a meditation on deep fakes and pornography and fame. And you don't even need to know um, the original game, Grand Theft Auto V, or The Sims to appreciate any work by Jackie Connolly because she's, um, she's able, her talent is to take a video game and turn it into something completely different that is powerful, evocative, um, emblematic of, 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 uh, of, of our culture. And the same applies to Sarah Sadiq, who is another artist from, uh, from, from um, Marseille, from Southern France. And um, she uses, once again, GTA 5, for example, to talk about immigration, to talk about the notion of um, uh, popularity and fame in the digital age. Um, she remediates the format of TikTok uh, to make her video. And this is a video that we show at the latest edition of the Milan F Film Festival. And um, Machinima is, is a part of her portfolio of, 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 of artistic experimentation. There's so much stuff that she does. And so she does installations, she does, you know, um, uh, sculptures, uh, performances. And once again, 
you have a character, Benedetto, this guy who is, a, who is an immigrant from Northern Africa. And the story that you see in this video, which is six, 16 minutes long, it's completely separate, distinct from the world of Los Santos, which is a kind of like a simulation of California and you know the American dream, et cetera. And so once again, I want to underline the amount of effort and talent that you need to create this kind of story. This is not simply just like, you know, by recording yourself and then, you know, adding a few dialogues. Um, again, the French are so ahead when it comes to uh, machinima as a um, form of art, video art. Um, uh, Jonathan Vinel is another a popular um, uh, creator and, and filmmaker uh, who presented this film, Martin Pleur, uh, very similar in, in theme and tone to um, Sarah Sadiq's work. And it's a work that was presented, for example, at Berlin Film Festival. What I'm trying to say is a lot of machinima now is re a regular part of international film festival, Rotterdam, Cannes, um, uh, Cima du Real, uh, the Real. Um, Berlin, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and these are films also that are presented by big and powerful um, art institutions like, the, you know, Vinel at a retrospective of the Prada Foundation in Milan. So we're talking about, you know, um, perhaps the most visible art institution in, in, in Italy, in Milan, et cetera. And other things are happening that are, I, I, I want to under, underline for you is this notion of replay, remake, and reenactment. Once again, you take these video games, very popular video games, The Sims, um, Grand Theft Auto V, but increasingly a diverse palette of games and, and variety of games. And you recreate and reenact films. You recreate um, artistic performances. But I, I'm not simply talking about popular culture, um, TV series of, of, or cartoons or, or or films, you know, the popular, you know, uh, superhero films. I'm talking about this, for example. Um, I don't know if you can, if, if you look at this image, which is called, it's from a video called uh, 11 Executions by another French artist called Hugo Arcier, right? And it's, it's, it's 36 minutes of, of executions and deaths and, and violence. And you look at this and, 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 and it's bleak and it's violent and it's very harsh, but then the more you watch it, the more, if you, if you are, if you are, uh, a filmmaker, and I mean, if you're a um, uh, cinephile, if you're if you're, you're if passionate about film, you immediately realize that this is nothing less than a remake of a very controversial film by Alan Clark that um, he made in 1989 called Elephant, which also inspired Gus Van Sant Elephant, which is a film that basically has no dialogues. It's a sequel, sequ uh, sequence uh, after sequence of executions. It's set in uh, Northern Ireland, extremely violent, but it's shot, it, it reminds you of, of Grand Theft Auto, you know, the camera behind the, 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 the characters and they go around, they kill each other, they shoot each other. Um, it's a video game until the term. It's a machine until the term, right? And so turning this project into this huge installation shows you once again how media remediated, decontextualized, recontextualized, transformed. Um, one of my favorite examples is uh, Phil Solomon's uh, uh, remake or uh, recontextualization of empire. Um, I'm talking about the um, Andy Warhol's uh, uh, empire uh, film uh, that he made in uh, with um, John Amekas in 1985, uh, 1965, I'm sorry, just, you know, leaving the camera on the Empire State Buildings for six hours and 30 minutes, and then slowing down the frame rate to make the film longer. So it's like eight hours with a camera stuck on this building, right? A perfect example of slow cinema. And here comes Phil, uh, Philip Solomon, who is one of the most um, remarkable experimental filmmakers post World War II in the United States, recently died unfortunately, died, unfortunately. And what does he do? He basically takes Grand Theft Auto IV, Liberty City, and, um, and um, recreates this, but here's the catch, because in, in GTA 4, um, a day lasts basically 48 minutes, the entire uh, piece is 48 minutes, right? There are various like installations where this is running over and over again, but once again, it, it takes the, the, the conventions and the, the, the characteristics of games to create this specific remake, right? And there are others uh, that basically recreate um, contemporary performances by famous artists like, um, I don't know, William Popel within Grand Theft Auto V. So in Grand Theft Auto V, for example, and, or, um, uh, and four, Grand Theft Auto IV, sorry, you can't crawl. 
it's just not possible within, within the video game. So you have to mod the game, make sure that you have a, an instruction, a piece of code that allows the character to crawl. And then you uh, create a character that looks, an avatar that looks like this artist, and whose, whose performance basically consists of crawling through the streets of various cities, mostly New York, for hours and hours in, on end, right? It's just a performance. And so you do the same thing in Grand Theft Auto V or, or four, and you just like crawl and crawl and crawl. And that's basically the, the, the performance. Or you reenact, you know, a Vito Conchi's famous um, um, performance of following peace, where he follows characters, uh, people, strangers through the streets of San Francisco, uh, New York, I'm sorry, uh, until they uh, enter a building or they enter a private place or they get into a car, right? And you can do exactly the same and you follow the NPCs, you know, the known playing characters within the game. And if you start doing that, for example, you realize that these characters don't have a home. They just keep walking day and night endlessly. They're not programmed to go to home and eat and sleep. And so by, by doing this performance, for example, you can sort of like bring forth the um, uh, nature of the simulations, the artificiality of, uh, of this uh, um, otherwise pretty realistic, at least a realistic looking like um, game, right? Um, and this, okay, this example is the stuff of genius, but also of madness. Um, this is um, Alan Butler, Butler, and he is a genius um, artist from Ireland. So basically he made a remake frame by frame of Godfrey Regius, uh, Koyan Iskazi. Uh, it's 86 minutes of uh, an experimental artistic film. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Koyan Iskazi as part of a trilogy. And he remade it with Grand Theft Auto V. Now this is insane because again, First of all, an 86 minute machinima per se, it's, it's in, in, it takes at least like, I don't know, it, it, took, it, took, it took him like an, an year, one, one full year to do this, but he remade frame by frame, meaning that he changed, he had to recreate the look and feel of the film, which has an insane amount of, of uh, sequences and shots, um, create the avatars, find um, locations that are similar to the ones used by Geoffrey Rajo, um, create some uh, from scratch, create characters from scratch, perform as these characters. So if you're a machinima maker, you're simultaneously the filmmaker, uh, the cinematographer and the actor. I mean, it's insane the amount of work that would take to do something like this. And if you uh, go to um, Ireland, you can actually see this installation, which is permanently exhibited. And again, everything that you see is just made by him. You watch the film, recreate the shot and then within and then if it records it within gta 5 this is just insane uh it's just uh, truly truly madness um and then there are artists like jordi venstra who basically take the city symphony films of the early uh, decades of the 20th century um i'm talking about films like uh man with a movie camera by ziga vertov of um, berlin symphony of the city and they recreated within gta and here's the 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 Emphasis is not on the frame by frame um, analogy, but it's more about capturing the feeling, capturing the rhythm, capturing the idea of creating a narrative with, uh, within the narrative, right? A narrative of the city through their transportation, you know, like um, uh, mean, means of transportation, trains, planes, cars, exactly like um, Ruthman did with Berlin Symphony of Metropolis, which is really emphasizing, you know, the rise of the new urban environment, you know, the cars, uh, the trolleys, uh, um, uh, buses, et cetera, or, you know, Ziga Verto, which is shot in, you know, many different Eastern European cities. And it's, it's, it's basically a non-story. It's a, it's a film that shows a city pulsating and, and, and moving and, and changing. And, and you do the same with GTA V. And once again, you're somebody who's really familiar with, you know, the history and the aesthetics of film, the history and aesthetic of video games, and you combine the two to create something that is different, that is hybrid, right? Um, okay, this is my last example. Um, another thing that is happening now, what I mentioned before is uh, the, the post-human element of machina, which I find really interesting. So a lot of artists now are using live simulation and, you know, generative art or generative machinima, algorithmic animation to basically, 
create endless videos that sort of like recreate by themselves. Um, live simulations found in Ian Chang, probably it's champ is champion, um, is, a, is an artist that creates his own um, virtual worlds basically. Um, but there are artists that use, once again, existing machinima to make a point about society, culture, etc. cetera. Uh, Brent Watanabe, who lives in um, Washington State in California, for example, famously took Grand Theft Auto V, removed the character, put a deer and um, use an uh, artificial intelligence kind of algorithm to have this guy, this animal running through the city endlessly, right? And the entire video, which becomes a performance, which you can see because it exceeds your attention, your ability to watch, runs over and over and over again on, um, uh, on Twitch and stream live, right? And so it becomes like an endless film, an endless performance uh, by a machine right, uh, that is mostly watched by machines or bots or, or people, etc. Uh, another example is Joseph Delape Elegy, right, which um, uses the same kind of um, technology, the idea of a self-playing video game, a self-generating situation, takes once again GTA 5, but here there's a, there's a spin, there's a point, there's a catch, there's a punchline. He basically every day enacts the um, number of deaths by gunshot in the United States, so the video basically, the video is, so the back end of this video is connected to, the, to a website that tracks the number of people that die on a daily basis in the United States because of gunshots. I don't know if you're familiar with the fact that uh, in 2020, the first um, uh, cause for death for teenagers is, gun, is, 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 is guns, it's weapons, right? And so he uses this to make a point about America, right? And so this character goes around and there's another character that just shoot each other. So for example, let's say you have 35 deaths uh, on January 1st, you have the video generates 35 deaths within GTA 5. And then the next day it continues. And he, and he had this performance for a full year to sort of like visualize the, the, the tragedy, the entity, the gravity of the situation in the United States. And once again, you use an hyper-violent game or you have artists like Grayson Earl who takes once again GTA 5 to sort of like bring to the surface the underlying logic within this game. This is a game in which all the characters can shoot each other, kill each other, be extremely violent, but there's a catch. Cops don't eat each other. It's embedding to the game. The cops can't fight against each other. So he tries to create a virtual simulation in which he goes in and try to hack the system to make the cops fight each other, but it's not. There's like this kind of idea that Cops are like these special characters that are uh, different from anybody else or better from anybody else. And so he writes an entire you know, program to and makes a video to sort of like reflect upon um, the notion of police brutality. He made this work during the George Floyd uh, protests in the United States, for example. And once again, you know, where does the simulation end and reality begins and vice versa? So once again, we're very far and very distant from Grand Theft Auto V as a piece of entertainment, as, a, as fun, right? This becomes um, something else. And so, yeah, as I mentioned before, we see more and more of this. I see more and more of this. I'm sure you do too, because students are experimenting with machinima more and more. So even though it has definitely plateaued and it's definitely kind of like uh, over within um, the vernacular, the mainstream culture, the YouTube sort of like um, uh, milieu, I see a lot of interesting stuff happening in schools today and made by emerging students, artists. Uh, this is the last um, uh, episode of Viral, the, sh the platform that we have. And it's a three minute long video that explains the logic behind Minecraft, one of the most popular games in the world, uh, bought by Microsoft, celebrated as a very you know, educational um, uh, game. But once again, this student who graduated in 2020 and wrote an entire thesis on the neoliberal assumptions within Minecraft, made a three minute video that basically juxtaposes uh, the history of you know, Europe and, you know, the colonial powers, uh, slavery, and the logic embedded within, G within Minecraft. And it's extremely simple visually, but it's also extremely powerful conceptually, right? So that's what gets me really excited, uh, seeing students basically bringing together ideas, games, popular culture, history, etc. And so to conclude, I think, I think that Machinima it truly is an avant-garde. It truly is um, something that brings together different strengths, different ideas, different 
materials, different statics, different politics and policies. And um, yeah, I had a, I had a, a um, uh, kind of like a, the, my theory part at the end where I discuss what is uh, understood as an avant-garde, why, why machine is an avant-garde. And then I would basically conclude that uh, I stand with um, Al Foster um, basically assuming that uh, there's a need for an avant-garde today. I know that the term avant-garde is now kind of like dismissed mostly by many critics as something, you know, anachronistic, archaic, even politically contentious. But I believe that uh, uh, machinima is truly is today an avant-garde. Maybe we don't call it machinima or it's not machinima anymore, it's something else. But it's definitely something that we need, I think, to reflect upon visual culture, to reflect uh, upon video games, to, as he, as he says, uh, assuming, uh, to assume a position of permanent critique, to trace fractures that already exist within a given order, to pressure them further, even to activate them somehow. And so, um, again, I think that Machinima um, embodies and expresses and exemplifies some of the qualities that um, that uh, Foster describes. So yes, uh, this is uh, this is this is all. This is. I hope it was uh, um, clear enough. And I apologize for the technical glitches that I encountered today. And by the way, if you're interested in knowing more, a week from now we're unleashing the third season of Viral, uh, which is a completely free curated machine experience. So if you are interested in what I presented, you will definitely find something very weird, very crazy, uh, very uh, far out uh, on our platform. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your for your talk. Uh, very, <coughs> very expensive on, 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 on the examples and very truly um, knowledgeable of how machinima that I don't know about a decade ago or so it was a little bit more on the hype as you said or even further into the past and now it it seems that I don't know it it resurfaced as this aesthetic experience and artistic experiences that you are actually mentioning um so thank you thank you for giving us this uh overview on how this has been uh, developing. We have uh, time for a few questions. Um, and I don't know if any participants want to ask something to Matteo. I can start with, with a question and you can also uh, write questions on the chat if you want. Um, my question. Andre, comes, Andre, uh, have a question. Have a question. Andre. Oh, sorry, okay. Pedro. Great. Andre. I was not seeing you, Andre. <laughs> Andre. Thank you, Hilda. So, Thank you. <laughs> no, just a, uh, first, uh, congratulations for your presentation. It's very interesting. And I was curious about, if, about uh, the impact of, I don't know if I have some research about the metaverse. If you think that we will have the impact on those productions, or if we already have some examples of productions that use the metaverse as an environment. Um, thank you very much for your question, Andre. Um, the answer is yes, because Machinima actually um, exploded with the very first metaverse that we had, um, Second Life. I mean, not the very first, but definitely the most popular. Once again, it's, it's something that has been, it's gone now because Second Life is still around, but it's very niche now. And there's a huge um, um, production of machinima and artistic experimentation that uh, was, um, was 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 created with with um, Second Life and still exists, um, as a matter of fact. But what is happening today, for example, is um, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with a platform called VR Chat. No. Okay, you should check it out. Um, there's a film called We Met in Virtual Reality, which is incredible. It's basically like Second Life with a 21st century technology in which you can only interact through um, uh, virtual reality goggles and devices. And so, for example, um, I've seen some amazing machinima, some amazing documentary created with this. We show one called uh, Upward Forward. Um, there's, there's a, actually, there's a Ukrainian duo um, that right now is escaping from the war who made an incredible um, kind of like a documentary through 
um, VR chat. And to me, that's the uh, most uh, um, kind of like uh, uh, successful um, manifestation of the metaverse that you can find right now. And it's, it's truly remarkable. Uh, check out a VR chat. It's just, uh, it will blow you away. <laughs> it's very interesting. Yeah, let me look in the, right now. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Andre, for your question. Anyone else? Okay. Um, so I, I was thinking, Matteo, um, this uh, machine usually is, 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 I think Galloway asks, uh, uh, mentions this, uh, that machinima is basically uh, pure process, right? So the machine is doing, uh, is acting on its own and, uh, and, and is computing all, everything that, uh, that is happening along a game or a game that has been modded or etc. And I'm just thinking, uh, in, in which way do you think that this idea of manip manipulating this, the, the process of these games could play a role in the future of the education of uh, arts designers, filmmakers, uh, as it is being instituted or is being integrated into the practices of their own edu their education in different schools? What has been changing for, for this new generation of artists, designers from the previous ones? That because these are tools in which they can, they can help a lot for them to, I don't know, to rehearse a lot of things that couldn't be done in the past uh, or, or even in a lot of experimentation. What do you think has been the impact of the of this uh, practice in machinima for this new generation of artists? <clears throat> this is a this is a great question. This is a great question because um, there's so many implications, and I'm just gonna touch upon a couple because you know for for time constraints. But um, for a very long time, uh, you know, machinima was dismissed within the um, educational context because of its affinity and proximity with, you know, popular culture, but also because uh, you're basically dealing with um, intellectual property, right? So you're appropriating content that is made by others, right? It, this is not a tool. It's more like raw material that you appropriated, right? And so, mm -hmm. um, it's a gray area because, um, for example, I documented cases where an artist made a, kind of like a, a critical machinima of um, of, Grand Theft, of a game called Manhunt, and it was, you know, it received a, a cease and desist letter, letter by the lawyers. So some are also reluctant to embrace a medium that could you sort of like. Um, uh, bring you to, to core because you're appropriating again. Co companies usually love machinima because it's a kind, it's perceived as a promotional kind of um, content for the game itself, right? Uh, it's free advertising. We can talk about, you know, unpaid labor and uh, playbor for the companies. But when you try to make something critical uh, of the technology of the game, which you something that you want to do usually if you are an artist, you know, if you are uh, somebody who's, who's using, thinking about technology through technology, then some might be reluctant. And this is why, for example, there's another this is, there's another layer of machine which I didn't address in my talk for um, time constraints, but. Um, there's an increasing number of artists that are using game engines and game tools. Uh, it was in the original you know, um, definition by Jim Anson. So instead of using the assets per se, use the game technology, the same engines they use to create games or to sort of like appropriate smaller elements, right? So um, it's, it's, it, if somebody says something again, you know, you can do that. You can always like, you know, recall a fair use, you know, you can always say, well, I'm modifying the, the artwork so much and I'm creating so much of my own that you can sue me, you, I can do. So there's an, a lot of like artists now are using tools that were originally created for making games to make machinima, to make um, uh, hybrids that are like not necessarily interactive, they're critical. Um, but um, 
again, it's like using the you know a camera to you to make a film mm, that you use to make a film, but to make a machine in art. So it's like uh, using professional tools, uh, but you're not appropriating the game itself. Today, I show you in 99% of cases um, pro projects that were made with existing games, and also some say it's too easy because you are basically repurposing work that was made by other people. Okay, um, so whereas if you use you know um, Unity 3D or the Unreal Engine, you have to do a lot of creative work, like do stuff from scratch. And so it's more appreciated by some because it's more of your like authorial intent or something. But it, to, to, to answer your question, both expression of Mashima to me are extremely um, powerful because they can unleash a lot of creativity as, as soon as you start thinking outside the box, as soon as you start discarding the game originally. And you mentioned, you know, uh, Galloway. To me, Machinima is the perfect example of counterplay, right? You know, using the game against itself to create alternative yeah. narratives, alternative situations. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that uh, in, in, in that line of thought, we should uh, be making or investing more on making tools for Machinima and that would transform it and, I don't know, Bring it to a possible future of machinima, a new a new age of machinima, uh, in which that these tools are more accessible for people that, for example, are not on, not so keen on, uh, on coding, for example, because not every right, right, artist right. is keen on coding. Um, that would, uh, I don't know, bring in more people and to experiment more and more on machinima. Do you think? It would be, uh, <laughs> I don't know, it would be a good idea to invest <laughs> in, in creating this or, or not. Uh, it would uh, transform it so much that it would be not machinima anymore. What right, right, thoughts? right. No, I, I see exactly what you're asking. No, I'm, I'm, I'm a terrible el elitist, and I think that the more you democratize something, the worse it gets. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. No, it's just like photography, right? It's so easy to do. You press a button, right? We have a billion people making photographs, and you know, you, you end up with 99% of redundancy. Like, you know, Willem Fusser would say, right? You know, you're working for the apparatus. Or, but yeah. to answer your question, the, uh, that's exactly what happened with the history of Machinima, right? We, you have all these tools of the embedded. Um, so originally to make machine was really, really hard. You really had to develop your own tools, right? And, come, and here comes um, Rockstar Games that gives you the uh, Rockstar Editor, which is incredibly powerful, and it's used also by artists, right? Mm -hmm. And also um, uh, the Sims and other tool in other tools, right? So, or you know, Nvidia, right? You can actually mm -hmm. use uh, the GPU to make um, very powerful, you know, the Omniverse software tool. So, to me, I don't think we can. It's not really a problem of um, accessibility or. Uh, but it's more a problem of ideas. What do you do with all that mm -hmm. stuff, right? Are you going to produce more redundancy or are you going, what's your, the idea behind your hacking of the game or your appropriation, et cetera? And so, because I also use machine in school, this is the, the, the biggest problem that I, that I face. Um, it's like, oh, it, to me, it's like, it's too easy now, right? It's so easy to make a machine. In my, what is really difficult is to come up with a concept, an idea, something that, it's a groundbreaking approach to, so I don't, to respond, to, to answer, um, I don't think that the democratization of the tools necessarily leads to um, more creative production. I mm -hmm. think what you, it's, it's not really about the technology, but it's more about the idea, the intent behind the technology. And that requires, um, I think, uh, education, it needs, it needs dialogue, it needs uh, um, in somebody who's familiar with different kinds of aesthetics, you know, they, one of some of the examples that I show was really about people that are familiar with film, but also contemporary art, but also performance. Mm -hmm. And then they bring all this stuff together and they make something that is unclassifiable, right? That's what excites me. But anybody could do a machine. You just get a copy of GTA 5 and boom, you're like, in 10 minutes, you can do something. But um, uh -huh. like, what are you adding to the conversation? That, that would be my question. Yeah, it's it's multidisciplinarity, right? Uh, right, 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 right. It's the basis of machinima. Oh, I think Gemma has a question. Uh, Gemma. Hi, hi everyone. Um, hi, Matteo. 
Thank you for hey, uh, the uh, lecture. And I was wondering if you have ever encountered machinima done with mobile games. Huh, that's a very interesting question. No, not really. Um, most of machinima is uh, PC based historically or um, console based, but um, I've seen a few TikToks recently that um, could be considered machinima, and they're usually they usually um, uh, they use collage more, a collagistic kind of approach. But I haven't seen anything groundbreaking yet. Um, uh, spoiler and full disclosure: Gemma is uh, is, is also a curator uh, within Viral and the Milan, Milan Machinima Festival, so. Um, I think you should actually look for this new frontier. I think you, you're right in the sense that platforms like Instagram or TikTok could be uh, the, the, the new frontier um, for, for this kind of, uh, of, of content. Definitely, definitely. Okay, thank you. <laughs> sure. Oh, sorry, Pedro. Uh, Serena has a question she wrote in the chat. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. you're right. I've yeah. seen it. So Serena is asking if um, um, I've seen Can Chile a project ready for action. Um, uh, what my thoughts are? Oh yeah, okay. So this is a brilliant project. I love Ken Chile. is so great. He's an American artist who's been doing machinima forever, and we actually show ready for action in Milan in 2016 in an exhibition. And once again, this is genius, right? Because going back to the question that Pedro just asked, right? Um, it doesn't really hack the game. It doesn't modify the games. It takes uh, uh, videos of characters armed with like machine guns and uh, bazookas and uh, anything you can imagine. And it portrays them as they're waiting for the subway or a train or doing something completely mundane and boring, right? And so you, you take a super violent game and you subvert it and you present a guy that is sort of like, like everybody else waiting for the cab or the bus or something else. And you, you, you made a message, you know, it's just, it's just uh, this is brilliant. You don't really need um, necessarily to have coding skills or to you just need an idea. And so he makes all these videos and they're also a, a reflection on, a meditation on a commentary on um, surveillance culture because they're shot as if they're taken from surveillance cameras. So it's the idea of, um, there's so many things you can do about this project. Like, for example, I'll tell you this. Um, I live in America and I live in Italy, right? So in America, for example, it's completely normal to go around with a machine gun or, uh, I'm not kidding, in 41 states, if you go around with a machine gun or a gun, it's you're basically expressing your your, your freedom, your, your American-ness, right? But if you drink a beer, you could be arrested or fine, right? And so by making a video in which normal characters are walking around with a machine gun and M16 on their shoulder, you're basically making a commentary also on, on American culture and the idea of freedom and the idea of, you know, uh, the Fourth Amendment and blah, 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 um, through a video game that is deliberately, you know, uh, grotesque and, and upper violent. So, um, yeah, I love Ken Shelley's approach and Ready for Action to me is a, is a masterpiece. It's just very brilliant. Okay, I think uh, it's time we wrapped up. Uh, thank you, Serena, for your question. Thank you, Matteo, for your availability and this lovely talk. Sorry about the technical glitches. Uh, I, I think I you had technical sorry. glitches on your side, and I had it on mine. I started this talk on a different computer, and then I migrate, migrated to my own. <laughs> um, so we're seeing Matteo, we, we called it, uh, uh, the, the image he has is, is, is a black hole because <laughs> you're not seeing his face. Uh, you're not missing much. <laughs> it's, a part, it's part of the process. We need to, to, to take these things as they are and not worry too much about it. Um, but it was lovely to have you here, Matteo. Thank you very much. It was very Likewise. enlightening. Uh, and we hope to uh, get in touch with you in the future. Um, and everyone go see uh, the Vral uh, exhibit as Matteo invited you, right? It is next week, right, Matteo? Yes, and uh, viral.org is completely free and um, expect the unexpected. That, that, that's all I can say. <laughs> all right, great. Okay, thank you very much, Matteo.